Tuesday, August the 4th. Uh, we're here for a city council work study and we'll call this meeting officially to order. We'll take roll call. I believe we are all present minus uh, council member Florinda Rives. Um, I did get a text saying that she'll be jumping on in like a couple of minutes. So we're she, she just jumped on. Okay. Well, then we're all present. <laughs> right now is your final uh, call to submit speaker request forms. Um, Crystal, do, did we receive any before the meeting? We did not, Mayor. Uh, and not to worry if you don't, um, if you haven't submitted one yet, because we will be taking questions um, uh, right after the presentation. So we'll be using the chat um, feature for you to ask any questions that you have, or also I can unmute you if you have um, a video on as well too. So um, we'll go ahead and get started with our item for discussion only. It's number one is our COVID-19 update from the Maricopa County Health Department. And I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Sun and Shine, and she'll be presenting. And if Steve, you can go ahead and have her PowerPoint that'll be up and we'll give the floor to Dr. Sun and Shine. The rest of us, if we can remain muted, um, that would be great so we don't get part of any feedback. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay. First big hurdle. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, members of the council, for uh, being present and for the opportunity to share with you uh, information about COVID-19 in Tolleson. I know that says COVID-10, but that was to make sure that you were awake. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, so this is a COVID-19 COVID update that we wanted to share with um, members of the public and the council in Tolleson to make sure that you know what's happening in your city and, um, and what everybody can do to participate in making sure that it doesn't spread further. So uh, next slide, please. What we're going to go over today is what's happening in Maricopa County in general um, and then talk about the rates in Tolleson of COVID-19, and I'll explain what a rate is. Um, the particular boundaries that we used to determine what Tolleson is, because I've now learned that that's not as straightforward as some people think it is, and I'll share with you the exact sort of um, shape file that we use to define Tolleson, and then I'll talk to you some more about what public health is doing in general for everyone in Maricopa County, and specifically what we're doing for the residents of Tolleson, and then what the residents can do uh, to participate in the response. Um, and next slide, please. So let's get started. Um, this is something that we refer to as an epi curve or an epidemiology curve, and it's the way we communicate um, amongst ourselves and with the public, not only how many cases have we had to date, but how many cases we're seeing every day. And it helps us look at the trend of cases in general. Now, these are only cases that are reported to public health. And that's really important for you to know. We know there are people out there who are sick with COVID-19 and maybe they don't have symptoms or maybe they didn't go to the doctor or they wanna get a test, but they can't find a test. All of those people are not gonna be included this, in this data. This is just ones that are that get a test and all tests are automatically reported to public health. So what you can see is um, this particular, um, what it's looking like in Maricopa County is that right about two weeks after the stay at home order expired, and you can see that arrow right there, um, we started to see an increase, which we expected because we know that social distancing was relaxed considerably. And this, um, this is what happens when people stop social distancing and uh, when, when they're not wearing masks. And right at this point is when the governor allowed counties and local, um, other local entities to put a mask requirement in place. And as soon as we put a mask requirement in place, it typically takes 
about 14 days for any intervention we do to take effect. You can see just about two weeks later, we started to level off and we've been seeing a decrease since then and we're, we're very grateful for that. Next slide, please. The other thing that we follow very closely is um, Maricopa County hospitalizations. And I want, I want to be clear, it says Maricopa County, but this is actually data from Maricopa County, Pinal County, and Gila County because that we only have the information in, um, in regional form. It's the central region, but the vast majority of hospitals that are in the region are Maricopa County hospitals. So it's Maricopa County people who are hospitalized that really drive these trends. And what you can see is that just about two weeks after we saw the peak in cases, we saw a peak and a plateau in our hospitalizations. Um, and these are people hospitalized with COVID-19 and they have gone down consistently for the last uh, month or so. You can also see this second curve here. These are patients with COVID-19 seen in the emergency department or the emergency room. And although it's been kind of noisy, it also has trended downward. And then this last line are the number of people who are admitted to the hospital with COVID-19, and that has also been trending down. Next slide, please. Lastly, we follow Maricopa County deaths. And unfortunately, this, I hope you guys can see the end of that slide. But what you can see is um, that about two weeks after our hospitalizations increased and about a month after the stay-at-home order expired, we did start to see an increase in deaths due to COVID-19 that always lags behind. And unfortunately, we're, we're continuing to see an increase in our deaths in Maricopa County. So that's something that lags considerably behind, behind all the other data, but we're hoping that we'll reach our uh, plateau of that soon and start to go downwards. Next slide, please. All right. So now you've seen the epi curve for Maricopa County, and we wanted to show you the epidemiology curve for Tolleson. And what this is, is again, only Tolleson residents, so people who live in Tolleson proper, who were diagnosed with COVID-19, and it's by the date of the specimen collection. So that means the day that you go in and you either have your swab done or you have um, your blood drawn, that is the date that is gonna be shown on this graph. And it's from April 21st to July 18th. And what you can see is that in April and May, there really wasn't much going on. Um, right around the same time that that stay at home order expired, which is right around here, Two weeks later is when we started to see the increase in Tolleson, just like Maricopa County. But interestingly, it dipped back down again, and then it really shot up right here in the middle of June. And we're not quite sure what led to that big spike right there. But what this is to us is a, a clear outbreak um, in Tolleson. And in this case, we don't really call it an outbreak because we don't know exactly what led to it, but I'll give you um, some language that we'll use in just a minute. Next slide, please. So whenever we're talking about the number of cases in a particular location, we like to use the term rate or case rate. And what that allows us to do is to compare uh, places of different size and different populations to each other, because obviously you're gonna see a lot more cases in Phoenix than you are in a much smaller city like Tolleson. So you can't compare those two numbers directly. So what we do is we take the population into account and we use a common uh, denominator so you can compare them directly. So the case rate is the number of people who are diagnosed with COVID-19 divided by the number of people that live in the area, and then you multiply it by 100,000. So whenever we give you a rate, we say it's this number per 100,000 people, even though we know that there aren't 100,000 people in Tolleson. But that just allows us to compare apples to apples. So to give you an example, Maricopa County had 54,757 cases in June. So to get the rate, we take that number 54757, divide it by the total population in Maricopa County, which is listed, multiply times 100,000, 
and that tells us that our case rate is 1,221 cases per 100,000 persons. That's where Maricopa is for the month of June. Uh, next slide, please. So let's look at Tolleson compared to Maricopa County's rates. So what I did was I took Tolleson and I put how many cases they had in May, 24, how many cases there were in June, 213, and then I turned it into a rate by dividing by the population and multiplying by 100,000. And the case rate for Tolleson is 2,889.3 per 100,000. I just walked you through Maricopa County's rate. That's compared to 1,220.8 cases per 100,000 in the county. So now I can compare those two numbers directly. And you can see that the rate in Tolleson is almost two and a half times higher than the rate in Maricopa County. Even though Maricopa County is much bigger, we accounted for that, and we know that something's going on in Tolleson, something that's making the rates more than twice as high as in Maricopa County's. Then what we did was we took the rate in May and compared it to the rate in June for Tolleson, and we took the rate in May and compared it to the rate in June for Maricopa County, and we found that not only uh, the, the rates were bigger, in June than they were in May, but the rate was increasing faster from May to June in Tolleson than it was in Maricopa County. Again, showing us that there's a lot more cases and it's spreading more quickly. So that is what we consider in Maricopa County to be a hot spot. A hot spot just means that whatever's happening in that community, there seems to be more spread and it's happening faster than other places. And that tells us we need to do something different to try and prevent further spread. Next slide, please. So we wanted to make sure that everyone felt reassured that when we talk about Tolleson, that we're all talking about the same thing. So we were asked, well, when you look at all these cases, and you're comparing us to Maricopa County, are you using the right boundaries for Tolleson? So this is the boundary that we used, and we double-checked before we showed it to everyone to make sure it is the right boundary. And this is the boundary we used for Tolleson. So only cases that actually live within this blue area were included in the case rate. And then there's another thing that I wanna highlight. We know that there is another outbreak inside of Tolleson at the JBS beef plant. And we wanted to make sure that we knew what was happening in Tolleson outside of that outbreak. So when we calculated those rates, we did not include outbreak cases. So what we know, actually go back one slide, please. So what we know is that this rate, 2889, 0.3 per 100,000 does not include any of the cases associated with the beef plant, and it's still 2.4 times higher than Maricopa County. So that's important that people know. We, we wondered, well, maybe this is being driven by the outbreak that we know about, and the answer is it's not. Even if you exclude those cases, it's still much higher. Okay, next slide, two slides now. So this is a picture of the 85353. Um, uh, it's, what is it called? It's a piece of a map. It's a layer, a layer from a map and a shape file. And when you compare 85353 to the map of Tolleson, you can see that Tolleson is 5.45 square miles and that 85353 is 21.06 square miles. And there was concern, apparently when the census was done, they misrepresented um, the city of Tolleson using the 85353 zip code, which is much bigger than Tolleson. But we wanted to reassure you that when we checked your rate and we monitored it, that we're using the actual city of Tolleson proper. Next slide, please. So we know a lot of people, parents, families, teachers, everyone is concerned about going back to school in general, and obviously going back to school in Tolleson now that we just told you that we're seeing a lot more spread. We've gotten a lot of requests for data, particularly by um, some folks on the phone, people who are associated with schools, because everybody wants to make decisions that are best for students 
and parents and teachers to keep everybody safe and, and educate safely. Um, so we wanted to let you know what type of data Maricopa County Public Health is going to be providing, not just to Tullison schools, but um, to, to all schools, but in particular, we're going to be providing an epi curve, much like the one we just showed, every two weeks to the mayor, who um, can then distribute it to the whole city council. And when we look at that, it always looks at a seven-day average. That means that trend line will, will average a week at a time. And it's always going to be 14 days behind. And that 14-day lag, or um, being 14 days behind, is because we know that it takes some time when you get your test done or collected for the results to come back. And we want to make sure that we have all those test results back and the data are complete before we actually share the data. So every two weeks, we'll send you a new epi curve so that you can tell what interventions or if the interventions that you're putting into place are working and are we seeing a decrease in the spread. The other thing that we're, we're going to be doing for Tolleson and for the entire county is we're going to provide a map that shows the percent of tests that are done overall that are positive. And that percent positive test or percent positivity is what a lot of folks are talking about, both international and national metrics. And it helps tell us how much spread in the community there is of COVID-19. And it's the one metric that people are, are saying is the most helpful for knowing when it's safe to reopen school. And when I say reopen school, I don't mean go back and send everybody to school in person. I mean, do it in a modified way with masks and social distancing. Um, and there are ways that you can do a hybrid model, but no matter what, if school goes back, it will definitely be modified from how it normally is. So that percent of positive tests, we will be able to present on a map by zip code, and we're hoping to be able to present it also by school district and by city. So it's going to be a multiple layered map, and that will be available for um, school personnel and administration and other folks to look at when they're making their decisions about returning to school. And I know you're thinking, when are we going to get it? <laughs> the answer is we have to wait until ADHS, the Arizona Department of Health Services, comes out with their school metrics. And as soon as they come out with their formal recommendations for school metrics, then we're going to be able to put together a dashboard that has those metrics down to zip code um, so that people can access the data. So we're hoping about a week after ADHS releases their metrics, you'll have that information available, and it will be publicly available on our website listed here. Next slide, please. So what is public health doing in general for everyone in Maricopa County? As soon as that positive lab is reported to public health, we contact that individual who's positive within 12 to 24 hours, both with an automated phone call and with a text message. And it's really, really, really important that when you see that text message from Maricopa County Public Health, that you know it's really Maricopa County Public Health. I promise you it's us. And that's us telling you. And you'll also get a phone call. And if you're concerned and you're like, well, what if it's not Maricopa County? What if I'm being scammed? It'll actually provide you a phone number that you can call and verify that the text and the phone call are real. And you can go on our website and it also gives you that information. So it's really important that if you do get a phone call or a text, that you answer it because we'll give you important information about how to isolate yourself. So once we do notify people that they've tested positive, we explain how to isolate, how long to isolate away from other people. And we also will continue to monitor for hot spots. So we're going to be looking at the city level and at the zip code level and looking for other areas to see if they're hot spots so we can help them similarly to Tolleson. And um, we will continue to work with known hot spots so we can make sure that we can decrease the spread. Lastly, we are looking for outbreaks. Outbreaks typically are things that are associated with one known place, like maybe it's a school or maybe it's a particular location where we know a lot of cases were exposed. 
and we'll work with them specially to make sure that we can decrease the spread before it gets too big. Places that we really focus on are our highest risk places like nursing homes, schools, um, and any other setting where people live in close quarters. So any type of assisted living facility, jail, shelters um, where people experiencing homelessness live, all of those are high risk and those are ones we monitor very closely. And when we do this monitoring and when we call cases and we investigate them and we find out information, we're always focusing on preventing future infections. So rather than, you know, we have um, often 1,000 or 2,000 people a day that we contact, rather than focusing on every single place that they were in those 14 days, all the grocery stores and the stores, which it's, it's nearly impossible to know where somebody actually got the infection. So what we do is we focus on where were you when you were infectious? Because if we know that they went to a high-risk place, where we can prevent future infections from spreading, that's what we'll do. We'll say, okay, well, if you were in this area and you exposed all these people, we can contact them, let them know that they were exposed, that's contact tracing, and ask them to quarantine and stay away from others so that they don't spread it. So we, we focus much more on what happened, um, exposures that we can prevent in the future rather than figuring out what happened in the past. Uh, next slide. So lastly, what is public health doing specifically for Tolleson residents? We uh, notified the city and the public that this has been identified as a hot spot, which is the purpose of this presentation today. Um, Janine Fowler, who's sitting with me, has worked with our logistics program uh, to provide 20,000 cloth face masks to residents. It's really important that everybody mask up in Tolleson whenever they're around others outside of their household. And we want, 20,000 isn't enough, you let us know. We'll get you the face masks that you need. We want everyone to have them regardless of whether they can afford them or not. Um, we're providing data to monitor COVID-19 spread as I talked about every two weeks. We'll give the epi curve and we'll also be providing the percent positivity by zip code and hopefully by school district and city. Um, and, we, and that's weekly. Uh, and then we're offering increased testing. And I wanted to clarify that this testing will not be done by SonoraQuest. Um, I will tell you that we found out today SonoraQuest has caught up on their backlog of testing, but we have identified a provider that has been much more reliable in getting test results back in just a couple of days. We know people are frustrated at that long wait time to get their test results back, so we are not going with SonoraQuest on this. And that testing is scheduled at Arizona Desert Elementary from 8 to 2 p.m. on August 8th. And the number is covered up. Can't tell. 22nd. <laughs> August 22nd. Thank you for that. All right. And lastly, um, we are developing a plan for supporting COVID positive residents who cannot isolate safely at home. We know that there are some families where there's a lot of people living in the household. Um, maybe there's a caregiver of other people who are sick, and it's impossible to separate the sick people from the well people to keep everybody from getting sick. So what we do is we'll offer a place for those individuals to isolate while they're ill. That includes transportation. Um, they will not get medical care while they're in this place, but they will get checked on, and they will also be provided with food and necessities to make sure that they're okay until they're no longer infectious, and then they can return back home uh, for which transportation will be provided. Next slide. So lastly, what can you do? I know these are very familiar messages, but th this is what works. There's lots of science and lots of data, and I have to tell you, I. I have looked at the data, wearing a mask really works. You saw what happened to our epidemiology curve when we put a mask requirement in place. We ask you, please stay home as much as possible. If you have to go out, wear a mask, make sure it fits well around your face. Every time you touch that mask, make sure that you use hand sanitizer, don't leave home without it. Um, limit gatherings to less than 10 people. We know that when people get together, that's when disease spreads. Um, and then wash your hands or use san hand sanitizer frequently. And please do stay informed. That's one of the reasons we're trying to put as much data and information on our website as we can. 
please go to um, maricopa.gov slash COVID-19 and you can get all of this information and we want you to stay informed and participate in your community in stopping the spread. And next slide, please. All right. And these are some materials that we have that are available on our website. All of them are on there in English and Spanish. This is a uh, sheet that when anyone in the county gets tested, they're handed, and this is what you can do while you're waiting for your test results to get back. We know that this is circulating in the community. If you have any type of symptoms, we strongly encourage just assume that you have COVID-19. Please isolate yourself away from other people. There's a survey that you can go to even before you get that text or phone call. You can enter that information and speed up the process of getting your contacts notified. And then communicate with people that you were around when you know you were having symptoms because they were likely exposed. And the sooner they get isolated, the less likely it'll be to spread. Next slide, please. This talks about when to seek medical attention, again, both in English and Spanish, and talks about what you can do to protect yourself and others from COVID-19, really focusing on the fact that we know some people have hardly any symptoms at all, and some people get very sick. And we also know that sometimes people have very mild illness that first week, but then the second week they can get really sick. So this tells you, well, when should I be worried? When do, I, when do I need to go in and see a doctor? Any trouble breathing, any chest pain, any difficulty thinking or concentrating, inability to stay awake if you um, have blue lips or face, that is when you really need to see a doctor right away because things could be getting worse. Next slide, please. And then how to wear and care for face masks. I know everybody's tired of hearing it, Face masks are really going to be the answer to stopping the spread until we have a vaccine that works. Please um, have plenty of them. If you don't have them, uh, we are making them available in your community, and um, we will work with uh, the mayor and the council members to let folks know where they can get them. Make sure you wear them correctly over your nose and your mouth. I can't tell you how many people wear them under your nose. That's not helpful. Cover your nose and your mouth, and every time you touch it, make sure you sanitize your hands. And then again, try to limit going out unless you, unless you have to. Next slide. That's it. This is our website in both English and Spanish and our public hotline if you have any questions, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have now. Thank you, Dr. Sun and Shine. This was great information to provide us with all the data. And I just want to thank you and your department uh, for really collaborating with our city um, and really, you know, wanted to provide a public health update uh, to our council and, and to our stakeholders as well. Um, you know, we've been working hand in hand with Supervisor Gallardo as well, too, and together. I am confident that we will slow the spread here in Tolleson, but I'm very thankful and grateful uh, for all the resources that you're offering. Um, and we will continue uh, to work with you. I believe we have a slide uh, from our city that'll talk a little bit more about uh, the programming that will get rolled out. And then after that, we'll go ahead and take questions from council. And then after that, from um, our participants that are on the line. Okay, who do we have presenting? Santiago? That's me, Mara. Sorry, this is Reyes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I didn't know I could unmute myself, so I apologize. First, I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank the City Council for allowing us, uh, with the Mayor's leadership, to do what we had to do to protect our people. Um, almost immediately, uh, we started to rearrange our entire organizational behavior, beginning with remote work, um, making sure that, that as, as difficult as it is for an organization like ours that is comprised of very affectionate people that we change that paradigm to help each other understand that the best thing we could do is stay away from each other. It doesn't make any sense because that's not who we are. Much like the city of Tolleson, most of you know how I grew up. I grew up with four generations in my household and we, my brother and I would pass out on each other every night. So um, thank God that, that uh, we're, we're not bunched in that little house anymore, but we still have many, many of Tolosonians 
who grew up the same way wouldn't have any any different. Uh, we are a very, very uh, compassionate, very intimate community, um, and that's what helps to it, it promotes spread. And that that's what's difficult because that's who we are. Uh, with that, and in response to that, um, we've been able to to I believe Mr. Holiday said recently about seventy five percent of those that can work remotely are. Um, our human resources director, Wendy Jackson, has become our local CDC doing the tracking, the tracing, and then identifying and finding testing for all of our employees. And she continues to, to search for empl uh, testing opportunities for our people. Um, in addition to the over 2,000 uh, tests that Mayor Tovar has secured with her various partners, uh, there's a, a large amount of testing going on in Tolleson because we want to know the truth. And I can't thank Dr. Sunshine and Ms. Fowler enough for taking the time to put this presentation together because we finally got this data after Mayor's been asking for us since March, I believe. So thank you again. Um, our messaging has been solid. A lot of the information that was shared by, by Dr. Sunshine has been pushed out already by our Public Affairs Division and obviously our police and fire, uh, they, they show up every day and they do what they have to do to protect us. So I wanna thank the, the, the whole team that's on today for everything. And, and last and certainly but not least, Kim and Santiago for making sure that our minds are still nourished as well as our bodies. And what you see on this slide is, is exactly what the Human Services Department is offering. It's a mixture of existing services like our housing rehabilitation program we've been doing since 1982. Uh, but that's been receiving more and more support from the county and every other uh, resource Mr. Cornetho can pursue He's in constant search for, for financial resources while he's delivering the services, while he's taking applications, he's, he doesn't stop. And I know he's in talks with Maricopa County now to see about getting some more human resources to help out with those processes. So we're grateful to the county for that as well. So let's just go down the list and I'm happy to be stopped in the middle of it, Mayor, with any questions. So home delivered meals, we're doing 80 to 100 seniors daily in Santiago, please. I know I, I may end up butchering this, so please feel free to jump in. Um, so we've always done home delivered meals, but I believe that's ramped up significantly. Uh, since the first decision we made, I believe Mayor was to send the seniors home because they are the most vulnerable population. Uh, next is commodity boxes, 150 each, uh, first Friday of every month. Produce bags, 150 each, second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Those are common practices, but again, we've ramped those up significantly. Discussion group, I love this one. Discussion groups with seniors, senior center members via Zoom. If you've ever been to our senior center and Councilwoman Laborin can attest, it's a party every day. Anytime I'm frustrated about, we might've lost a big economic development deal or something, I go visit my aunts over at the senior center and they always remind me of how great I am, at least in their eyes. Uh, and I love it and I love to see them there and I love to see uh, every, everyone I grew up with uh, in the senior center. Um, so that, like I said, it's a, it's a party every day and now ha not having that social interaction is very difficult. And, and I can't imagine how it is for them right now. So this was a brilliant idea Santiago had to, to hold this socialization via Zoom. Um, and welfare checks over the phone to senior center members. And I know it, Maddie and Luce, and I'm sure everyone else is pitching in to make sure that our seniors are getting what they need. Um, deliver care packages, hygiene products upon request, that's self-explanatory, uh, and obviously deliver food pantry items and water upon request. And we've been receiving significant donations from many of our business partners through uh, Chief Fire Chief Good, and a lot of them is go are going through the Human Services Division for dissemination. Uh, provide a variety of community resources to clients. There's nothing that we won't try to do. Right now, like the mayor likes to say, there is no playbook, so anytime we're met with a unique challenge and every, every household is different. Uh, we try to find and, and culminate resources around that specific issue. So if there isn't anything anyone shouldn't ask for, we'll do everything we can to make it happen. Uh, Tolson Housing Rehab Program, that's, a, that's one of our more storied housing programs. And we literally rehabilitate homes, we remodel homes, make them, uh, make them more energy efficient, safer, bring them up to code. And I know you, uh, Santiago's received funding for that as well, in addition to our regular grants. Uh, refer clients to Maricopa County COVID Emergency Heating and Cooling Repair and Replacement Program. I just saw this uh, 
when Santiago provided me this list, that's that that that's another uh, uh, astounding resource that uh, that's been added to the repertoire. And of course, our weatherization program that's been around forever, but we have also dedicated more resources to that. Um, in addition to this, I know our Parks and Rec Department is still assisting the elementary school and the high school wherever they can to help make sure that our young people are getting the food that they need and any other type of, of support. So again, Mayor, I can't thank you and the council and, and my teammates enough, and certainly Dr. Sunshine and Ms. Fowler uh, for your compassionate leadership. I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Medrano. Um, thank you for that report. I know that we have um, those on the line too from our school board, um, Superintendent uh, Dr. Hightower, and then we have Superintendent Nora Gutierrez as well, and hopefully some of their board members on, on each side. But again, we've been working collaboratively with both superintendents to get an itemized uh, in having our needs assessment list, not only for our community, um, but also with our schools, because we know that together we are one community and we are going to be working collaboratively together to try to slow the spread um, as best possible within our community. So I just wanna thank our partners um, with our superintendents and our board members for their passionate service um, in wanting to make sure that our community stays safe and slowing the spread as well too. Um, I will go ahead now and open, let me see if I go back to gallery view, uh, to see if we have any questions from our council uh, in regards to Dr. Sun and Shine. So I have a hand up from, um, I have council member Adibas and council member Bondine. So can we unmute council member Adibas? Go ahead, council member Adibas. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Sunshine and Ms. Fowler, thank you so much for this information. It's greatly appreciated. I, ha I have a quick question regarding schools. Um, I, I teach first grade and so um, I have this qu burning question. Um, Governor Ducey has a return to school by August 17th date. Um, and our, our schools, both of our, our elementary and our high school have been grappling with this decision about reopening and, and how to do that safely and, and the well-planned plans that they have for reopening eventually. Um, but at this point, I just feel that it's not safe. But with that um, executive order that he has um, and that particular date of August 17th, where we schools must open a safe area. Um, they have to have some type of staff on hand to um, be open for our most vulnerable students. How does that work with this um, maybe like hotspot label? This hot, this that we're in, we're not a typical school, but we're more, or community, but we're more of a hotspot. Is there any? guidance you could give for us with regards to that? Thank you for the question. It's, it is a, a good question and one that we have asked ourselves several times. So what I can tell you is that we are uh, slated to receive those final metrics from Arizona Department of Health Services no later than Friday the 7th. And I think we are all anxiously awaiting to see what those metrics are. We have already put in a request to the state health department um, to request of the governor. There is a section um, that I, I believe you're referring to in the executive order that says that um, schools can request a waiver if there is an outbreak in their area. And so we've already put in a question to ADHS, what are the qualifications for a particular region to meet the definition of an outbreak and get that waiver? Um, we've not yet received an answer, but that's one of the things that's on the top of our list because certainly a community where we've identified that the rate is more than twice uh, the rate of the rest of the county, which is our threshold for a hotspot, Certainly that would be a community that we would identify as potentially meeting those criteria. 
So we're waiting for an answer from the state. Obviously, the governor <laughs> is the one who has the final say in exactly how the executive order is carried out. But what we're planning to do is the minute that we get those metrics from ADHS, we're going to be able to calculate those metrics for Tolleson um, and for all of the other areas. But we will go back to the state and say, these are the metrics that you have put out, and this is where Tolleson falls. Um, and then make that request again, would this qualify for a waiver in that area? And that's the best I can do to answer your question. Yeah, okay. So the seventh, we're waiting for the seventh. The, the seventh is gonna be a very big day. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Council Member Adibis. Council Member Bundeen. My question is just about the two testing appointments in August. Um, did I hear whether it was by appointment or if we were going to have to call in to make an appointment or if it's by first come first serve basis? Yes, um, great question, Council Member Bundeen. Uh, with this vendor, it's actually going to be first come first serve, so no appointment will be necessary. Um, we are working in partnership with Dr. Hightower and her team. There at the elementary school district. We're having it at Arizona Desert, um, the gym. And so it'll be at least uh, 500 tests per day. So August the 8th on Saturday from 8 to 2, we'll have 500 tests. Um, and we're hoping that we use every single one of them um, and know that we have a different vendor that will get the results within two to three days. Thank you. Do I have another council member that has any questions? And I'm scanning real quickly, so. Yes, Council Member Adidas. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I guess, um, just to like to add on to that type of question, um, I know um, they keep saying, and I say they, the news, we hear some information regarding students not being, um, as risky or because they're um, younger in age that they're not that demographic that is um, um, as likely to get sick or could get sick. Um, however, schools again, I'm gonna go back to that one, um, still have staff that are on, on, on the campus, right? So their students are working with people with on the campus or the campus itself is open with staff there. Um, but now you're not the students. I think my, my fear is what happens if we don't meet the criteria for the waiver and we're expected to open on the 17th? Um, again, I said our school boards on both the elementary and the high school have grappled with this dilemma to open, not open, open um, maybe just for s some sections of school. It's just, um, it's difficult for them to make a, this decision. And, and I, I applaud all their hard work and hours of dedication that they've decided that they've dedicated to this. Um, but I just wasn't sure, is, it, is there any information on students, younger children with regards to the data? You're gonna be very disappointed. Um, I just reviewed, there are two, two reasonably sized studies that um, we've reviewed. And for pediatric or, or studies in children, there's even when it's a whole population that they're looking at, a lot of times those age groups, they only have maybe 40 or 50 kids in the age group. So there's not a lot of large studies that are population-based, but there's two that have come out in the last couple of weeks. And, and this is the disappointing part. The very first one said, that it looks like younger children, and I believe it was age up to age eight or nine, seem to have less spread in households than older children, and older children seem to spread similarly to adults. And we all thought, oh, there's our answer. And just a couple of days ago, another study came out, um, and this was, uh, it was in JAMA, and what they show, this was from the city of Chicago, they show that younger kids actually have what appears to be more virus 
than older kids. So they are hypothesizing that younger kids might actually spread more than older kids. So if you're following along, you'll see that I just told you completely opposite things from two different studies, and it's driving us all crazy. What I can tell you, here's what I know for sure. We know that children can spread COVID-19. We know that for a fact. Um, we know that a lot of kids who get sick either have no symptoms at all or have very mild illness if they're healthy. We also know that children who have underlying medical conditions or chronic medical conditions are just as high risk as anyone else with a chronic medical condition. So when I talk about kids, healthy ones, they spread it. We don't know if they spread it as much or more than adults. Um, and we know that they can spread it to adults. And, and we know that um, they tend to have milder symptoms if they're healthy. That's it. That's really all we know for sure. Um, but I, I echo your concerns. I think when you've got staff on campus, they're in a different risk group. And um, no matter what, when you have a lot of people together, you have to make sure that you do some type of social distancing, which means trying to keep that six feet of distance. And no matter what, and I, I feel very strongly about this, whenever people go back to school, if it's still during the pandemic and we don't have a vaccine yet, masks have to be worn by students and staff. That is, that is not optional, in my opinion. So we have a recommendation or a guideline out, but the way we word it is we, we recommend that you require masks for every person who's in the school. Thank you. I have another question from Council Member Laurine. Um, my question is on, on the testing. If we don't have any symptoms whatsoever, should we still go get tested? Mayor, would you like me to answer that? Yes, please. So the, the recommendation, it, it's a good question. The recommendation is if you think that you might have been exposed to somebody who did have COVID, so maybe if someone in your family was ill and they didn't get tested, or you know somebody who is recently ill and you think you were around them, then it's very reasonable to go and get tested. Or let's say you've traveled on a plane recently. Those are all reasons that I might go get a test. Um, obviously, if, if you have any symptoms at all, headache, runny nose, sore throat, achiness, feeling feverish, you should definitely get tested. And please, when you do go get tested, make sure you're wearing a mask and try to stay six feet away from others. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at all. Maybe you don't have a question from Councilmember Mendoza or Councilmember Canero, because I know they're not on video, but if they have a question, if they want to unmute themselves and ask a question. Okay, um, I'll go back to Councilmember Bondi. I don't know if you can answer this for me or not, but I'm just curious about um, child care, like uh, uh, child care, uh, daycares. Um, I think one of the, the challenges for parents is if school, we, we would definitely want school not to open because it's safer for everybody. But then the problem is there's a lot of parents that, you know, kids are in school while they're working. And then if we had provided more, wanted to provide some kind of daycare, here we are still with a situation where the kids are still all together. So what's, what's the recommendation right now for daycares and uh, you know, places where kids are gonna be taken care of if they're not in school? Yeah, so this is, I think this is, this is the issue. It's the conundrum that we all have. Some parents need to work and you don't wanna leave your kids alone. So anytime you put, as you said, you put a bunch of kids together, there's going to be some risk. I, I don't want to say um, that, that there are daycares where there is no risk. What we can do is we can reduce the risk as much as we can, and we do that by keeping the kids in smaller groups, hopefully less than 10, so that if one of them does get uh, infected with COVID-19, that it exposes fewer people. We also 
say that anybody who is six and older should wear a mask at all times. And I, I wasn't sure if six-year-olds could wear a mask all day long, but the truth is they can and they, and they will. So those kids six and older should wear a mask. We had a lot of feedback when we first required the um, mask wearing in Maricopa County from uh, daycares or child cares of younger kids. And it really is challenging for those uh, younger kids um, under five to keep a mask on all the time. So we just ask that they do their best. Um, that's when it's a difficult scenario. And the best thing you can do is keep those kids in small groups and make sure that if any of the children have any symptoms at all, that you keep the children home. And same, same with the staff. And then everybody who can wear a mask wears them continually. Um, and I know that it's challenging for some schools. I know that there's also boys and girls clubs and there's other places that are open that can have children there um, to provide childcare if their parents have to work and there's no school. You know, I really feel for the school districts because now parents, you know, everybody's learning that there's 30, 35 kids in a classroom. What? How do you social distance 30, 35 kids in a classroom? And then when you have seventh and eighth graders, they're big kids, they're young adults. So it's yeah. just a difficult situation. How in the world do you do it safely when you have so many kids and only so many classrooms and so many teachers? It's such a difficult situation. I feel for these superintendents and governing boards that are trying to figure it out for us. Absolutely. I do too. I do Thank too. you. Um, I'll go ahead. I see Dr. Hightower here. If we can unmute her, Dr. Hightower, I want you to have an opportunity to ask uh, Dr. Sunshine any questions, and then I'll go to um, to Superintendent Gutierrez. Thank you so much, Mayor Tovar, and, and all the um, guests that are here, including my board president, Mr. Del Crandall. Thank you so much, Mr. Crandall, for everything that you're doing. I think Councilwoman Erive has articulated it in the best way. It has been very, very difficult uh, for governing boards and um, Councilwoman Bandin and for school superintendents. And, and it's not just isolated to Tolleson, this is um, across the nation. As I work with superintendents across the nation, we hear the same stories uh, repeated. Um, I don't have a question. I want to thank um, Dr. Sunshine. I know she's working closely with Arizona School Administrators, superintendents and president-elect for that organization. So there's a lot of work being done. Um, Janine Fowler, she has been extremely responsive um, to my request as well. Uh, the webinars that they have been putting out for schools and school superintendents are just spectacular with incredible information. Uh, they have sent out schools, uh, started PPE kits. So there's a lot of work that's happening at Maricopa County Public Health. So we're very grateful um, as school administrators for everything that you're doing. And I know you two are working around the clock and uh, we can't wait uh, to have that data. I know our governing board can't wait. Uh, we did have to move our governing board meeting that was scheduled for tomorrow to next Tuesday, uh, just so we could have that, that, that very critical health metrics and health data. And our intent is to, um, receive that data and act on it right away. And there's my, my intent is also to be submitting a waiver to the Arizona Department of Education for those learning labs. We'll see what happens, um, but that is the intent and that's what um, we'll be sharing with our, our governing board as well. But you, you encapsulated it, articulated the best way you could, Ms. Rives. It is It is very challenging. We have been in contact, Councilwoman Bandin, with groups like the Boys and Girls Club. They're pretty much full uh, for those 43% of families that really requested to have an in-person option, but they're full. They already told me, I know there's one that had moved uh, close by to Littleton. They said, we're already full um, with the Littleton kids. And, they, and of course, um, the Littleton School District, they would like to have more capacity as well, but um, they, they can't, they can't offer that. So again, grateful to Maricopa County Public Health. Um, Dr. Sunshine, if you can please thank Ms. Fowler. She has been just a tremendous asset to all of us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for giving us the data by zip code. And, um, and um, we're really glad that the governor finally decided to, to use health metrics uh, for in-person learning. Um, that should support a lot, of, a lot of school teams. So thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.
And just uh, when you, when I get, when I receive the, the two week updates on uh, the city of Tolleson limits, um, I'll make sure to share with both, uh, with you, Dr. Hightower and Dr. and with Superintendent Gutierrez as well too. I know it, it's more prevalent to, um, our city limits are more prevalent to you and, and the two schools that come here in Tolleson, but I know Nora could use it as well too, but her school goes throughout the entire zip code. But as soon as you know we receive it from the county, Dr. Sonnenshine will make sure to for forward that to you so that you have and, and your board have the most uh, accurate and um, recent data uh, so that when you have your board meetings and updates as well. And, and I appreciate it, Mayor. And um, also, um, Ms. Fowler has also shared the information and data and metrics for the City of Phoenix schools as well, which is very helpful. Thank you. I'll go now to um, Superintendent Nora Gutierrez. Do you like to make a comment or any questions? Yes, hello, hello, Mayor Tovar and council members and uh, esteemed guests. Um, yes, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I too would like to begin um, by saying thank you. I wanna say thank you to Mayor Tovar for being inclusive. Um, and we've been meeting regularly, weekly, and for sharing all the information, Mayor Tovar, as far as uh, the testing that you've offered through the city um, and the concern for our students and our staff and inviting them to participate is greatly appreciated. Um, also, uh, for sharing uh, the information and, and going to the county, I also reached out and uh, I wanna thank uh, Ms. Janine Fowler also. A uh, quick turnaround and getting the data that I requested. I do serve four municipalities, Glendale, Tolleson, Avondale, and Phoenix. And so I had many zip codes uh, that I needed data on and it was a very quick turnaround. I appreciate it uh, so that I can have sound information to make um, well-informed professional decisions um, in the best interest of our community, our students and our staff. Um, so Tolleson proper, yes, uh, definitely uh, has the highest numbers. Um, however, the other uh, municipalities aren't too far off. So there's great concern across the board for Tolleson Union High School District. Uh, currently, our board has um, been proactive and has already um, stated that uh, and voted that we will not open uh, school for students until first quarter, except for those students um, that we need to, according to the governor's um, executive order, that we um, are being told we have to serve. Um, so I have great concern as Dr. Hightower does and as Mayor Tovar does in bringing those students to um, together and the council members also, thank you so much for sharing your concern because um, whether it's in a classroom or it's in the same building and it's childcare per se, it's the same concern. Uh, the vulnerability to the students and to the staff who are working and um, no, there's not anybody um, online here or anyone that I work with that wants to make that call and have anyone, anyone, not even one individual exposed. And that's the situation we're finding ourselves in. So I too am looking very forward um, to hearing the metrics and um, thank you for um, stating that you have asked already for um, the governor to clarify exactly what uh, that need is and what that um, uh, data is going to have to reflect to indeed state that um, we are in the crisis mode and, and do not have that opportunity when we apply for the waivers not to open. Um, there is no one, no one more than superintendents, governing boards, school teachers, and families that want all their children back in school. Everybody does. Brick and mortar is the best way uh, we believe is public school educators. We want all of our students back, but not at the risk of their health, not at the risk of their health and our staff. Um, I currently have the teaching staff reporting to work. They reported today for the first day in serving students because we want to provide the best structured educational experience that we can for students at home. 
And so other than uh, staff that needed accommodations because they have, um, they're compromised in, in one way or another or childcare, our staff is reporting to work and our staff is also working from home. And they are working the regular schedule. So a student would check in first hour, second hour, third hour, fourth hour, et cetera. The teacher is online with the student working, educating the student, uh, engaging the student in uh, their lessons and trying to teach as normal as possible. It's not perfect, but we are trying our best to provide that opportunity for our students. So again, we're eager to get the data. Uh, we're eager, of course, as well as everyone else um, to get a vaccine. We know that's the safest, but I do want everyone to know in the city that we have taken all the measures to keep our staff safe. Our staff is instructed to drive to the school, park, put on their mask, and this is a requirement, put on their mask, walk to their classrooms, close the door. No one else is to go in the classroom. They are in there and they are teaching with all the materials that they need. The school is sanitized every day, top to bottom, every classroom, every area. In the teacher's room, there are Clorox, Clorox wipes, there are, uh, there's um, disinfectant, there are two cloth masks and surgical masks, and a pair of gloves for every single staff member on our site. The only area that a staff member would have to go to other than their classroom is to the ladies room or the men's room. And we have staff on site sanitizing the men's room and the ladies room every time it's used. So we are very fortunate. My CFO uh, began immediately in late February ordering all the PPE that we could get. And we also have the shields uh, that can go over the mask if there is a staff member who feels they need that extra protection. And we have ordered gowns for our special needs staff working who may need to work with uh, more closely with our special needs population. So we feel that Tolleson Union High School District has done everything in our power to keep our staff as safe as possible, but nothing is perfect. Nothing is perfect. And um, what we need is a vaccine what we need now is the data. So thank you again, Janine Fowler, for sharing the data. And thank you for sharing uh, the information today, um, the, the big picture that we could see and we can use. Uh, knowledge is power and we need all of the information that we can gain. So again, thank you um, to the Department of Health. And again, thank you, Mayor Tovar, and to the City Council uh, for your concern and for your support. Thank you. Superintendent Gutierrez, it's just a, a pleasure to work together with you and with Dr. Hightower as well too in trying to come up with uh, positive solutions and to be proactive. I do have a question from Council Member Canero and then Council Member Eddie Perfect. Can you hear me all right? Okay, now we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, okay, I unmuted myself. Let me just echo what everyone has already said to, uh, uh, to Maricopa County for taking the time. Uh, I know you, you guys are, are over your head sometimes with uh, all the problems that come in each and every day. And I'm sure you're working morning, noon, and night to get a better picture and find more solutions to all the issues that we're facing, not only here in Tolleson, but in the entire state of Arizona. So. Again, thank you so much for your time, for your hard work, and hopefully we will uh, be able to get our arms around this uh, someday soon. My, my question is, uh, with all this information that's been presented to council, uh, how, what's the plan and how soon will we get this information out to the residents of Tolleson? Because this is kind of a special bulletin indicating that we are in a, definitely in a hot spot. And, uh, you know, I, I, I travel down on the 101 and I've been telling a couple of folks 
we have a soccer field uh, adjacent to the 101. And I'm just amazed sometimes that uh, I go by there and there's 100, 200 people congregated uh, playing soccer on Saturday. And now maybe they have their mask on, maybe they don't, I don't know. But that seems to be a, a logical place where bad things could happen in, in relationship to this, uh, to this virus. But uh, I guess my question is, and uh, Mayor, uh, either if you maybe you can answer that as to what our plans are on how we're going to communicate this as soon as possible to the residents of Tolleston so they can be more cautious, be more proactive in terms of using the mask, washing your hands, and, and all the other protocols that are out there for, for everyone. Thank you. Great question, Councilmember Canero. We've been doing a, um, multiple things uh, in planning with the county health department as well, too, along with our both superintendents, um, both of our fire chiefs, and along with our directors. So we're going to be rolling out uh, not only the information that Mr. Madrona had presented in regards to the CAP office as well, too, but specific targeted messaging uh, with our public uh, information office as well, too, and I'll let Pilar speak in regards to that. And there's also some follow-up uh, programming that Santiago is going to be working with, uh, with the county as well too, uh, to define that even greater uh, so that we can look forward to uh, possibly having people actually going, uh, visiting every single resident and household that we have here in the city of Tolleson um, that can give them what we would call a care package and also having that valuable information in both English and Spanish and also taking a snapshot of that, uh, that home um, for a small needs assessment of what we can do collaboratively as a city and then how we can work with the county to bring forward uh, solutions to slowing the spread, whether it's testing, whether it's food, whether it's a rental voucher, um, but we're gonna have that targeting programming uh, rolling out pretty soon uh, so that we can get to every single household here in the city of Tolleston. But I'll hand it over to Pilar in regards to the marketing messaging that has already, um, uh, probably as we speak, is at the printers and get uh, ready for a print. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the question, uh, Councilmember Carnero. So yes, we already started to do our already uh, communication with the mid-August newsletter with the information that um, Dr. Sunshine was sharing as far as like what people can do in their homes should someone in their home be sick. Uh, there's a lot of great information as it pertains to households with um, you know, multiple families or just people, households that live in uh, smaller quarters. It's um, really great information. So you'll start to see that as early as next week in English and in Spanish that will be mailed out to everyone. Uh, specific information to regarding uh, Tolleson being a hotspot, we'll start to share out that information as early as uh, tomorrow. Um, we wanted to make sure to have this meeting first and have uh, um, have Dr. Sunshine given, giving her the opportunity to share this information with council and hopefully to really have community members being, be on here tonight so they could also answer questions. We will also be utilizing the August 8th and 22nd dates as um, an opportunity to provide information in English and in Spanish. We'll be using all our resources with Parks and Rec, Library, Senior Center to make sure we get that information out in both languages. Thank you. And if uh, those that are on the call that are just participants, um, if you can use the chat feature and if you wanna ask a question, please uh, send that question to me uh, on a Tovar so that I can read your question out loud. I'll go ahead and go next to Council Member Adibas. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I have a, just another question, sorry. Um, Ms. Fowler and, and Dr. Uh, Sunshine, um, with regards to the waivers, Right. As you can hear, we, we love our community and we're, we really want to support one another. So as a, as a city municipality, is it, um, I don't know, maybe a beneficial if us as a city were to apply for this waiver on behalf of our schools or should the schools, I, I've heard that they've already started to do the waivers, but what would be the um, most prudent way to, to 
apply for a waiver with regards to the school's reopening. Dr. Sunshine? Yeah, unfortunately, we really don't have guidance for you at this point. We've, we've asked the question of ADHS, and we're hoping that once the metrics are confirmed, we've asked them when they release the metrics to give us very clear guidance and metrics for what meets that waiver. And at that moment, we're hoping that they, um, we're hoping that we'll see it maybe as early as Thursday, but for sure by Friday. And as soon as we get those metrics, we're going to ask specifically not only what it takes to meet the waiver, but how one applies for the waiver. Is okay. it something that the county does on behalf of the community? Can the community, does the school? All, we, we want to know all that information, so as soon as we can, we'll ask. Um, okay. and we'll, get, we'll get back to you. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Whatever you need to do, we're, we're willing to do if, if, with regard to this. Thank you, thank you. We know that the seventh is going to be a big day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a big day for our schools, <laughs> our superintendents. And our, our communities, yes, yes. Yes, and I know that we're all anxiously awaiting um, that those metrics as well, too. Um, okay, if I'll open it up um, to any questions from the public, um, and you can go ahead and text and uh, message me uh, via the chat if you have any questions uh, for Dr. Sunshine in regards to our hotspot here in Tolleson. Um, Dr. Sunshine, I do have a question and just in regards, I know that we're going to be rolling out uh, quite a bit of things to help to mitigate and slowing the spread, um, not only here uh, with our cities, but also in conjunction with our schools as well too. Um, and we're gonna be doing more testing and getting that uh, testing results back. Uh, we're going to help with isolation as well, too, uh, for those families that um, have a household that are multi-generational, which I will definitely help. And uh, with all the great things and services that we're providing and will continue to provide additional as well, too, what is your estimate in regards to, you know, we're taking a very aggressive approach. Um, what is the time frame where you would see uh, our numbers potentially go down so that we're not actually rated as a hotspot. How, what is the time trajectory of, of a, where you could see results? So that's another great question. Um, I think what, what I can say, as I mentioned uh, previously, the minimum amount of time it takes for any intervention to show an effect in the number of cases is 14 days. So two weeks is sort of the minimum. Um, what we found uh, in a situation with another hotspot is just simply telling the public, hey, you're a hotspot, you really need to wear a mask, you really need to take this seriously, and giving the public the tools that they need to, um, to take care of themselves, making sure masks are available, making sure they know that if they have to isolate and they can't, that there's a place for them to go. That, in the past, has been enough to actually change people's behavior and change the spread. So I would start um, in the, the next two weeks, we should start seeing a difference, I hope. And we're, that's why we're going to be giving you those epidemiology curves every two weeks so that you can see a difference. Um, and again, they're always going to be delayed by 14 days. There's something else that I wanted to highlight. It's a tool that um, our intelligence group, and, and I don't want to take any credit for any of the data or any of the information. I have an amazing team, including Janine Fowler, and a whole intelligence and data team behind us that are doing all this work. But one of the things they've developed, because the recommendations from CDC on how long you isolate got a little bit complicated, and that's an understatement, um, depending on whether you have symptoms, depending on whether you uh, had serious illness or not, whether you were in the ICU, and whether you have certain medical conditions. We um, are putting a tool on our website that if you have symptoms, you can actually walk through a system where it says, have you had symptoms? Have you been tested? Is it positive? Is it negative? And you answer all the questions, and it will tell you exactly how long to isolate and on what day you are able to no longer isolate. So that tool is going to be on our website, and I want to make sure everyone's aware. Mm -hmm. Oh, in English and Spanish. That is a great tool, Dr. Sun and Shine, in regards to that. We'll make sure to push it out 
on our social media and then within our own organizations and with our schools as well too. Um, I want to mention one thing I know that we haven't touched upon, but we've discussed um, in our meeting groups with the county and also with Supervisor Gallardo, um, is the issue um, with families having difficulty when um, the worst happens during COVID, and that's when uh, one of our loved ones passes away. Um, and I know that each of us uh, on this call probably know someone who has um, recovered from COVID, that has had COVID, and sadly, um, someone that has passed away from COVID and especially here in our community. So we, we have discussed in regards to a, a funeral assistance program as well too for uh, community members uh, that are having difficulty when they uh, are presented with this uh, tragedy. Um, you know, that's the last thing on your mind uh, that you're thinking of. But of course, we are working collaboratively with the county uh, health department and also with Supervisor Gallardo um, and coming up with an assistance fund uh, for those families that are in need uh, for funeral expenses as well too. Um, and also just today, we also discussed with Supervisor Gallardo and our um, more outreach out to our small businesses here in our, in our community. So we're working with, um, with Jason Earp, our director, uh, and we're gonna be pushing forward on a potential webinar in both English and Spanish and also trying to outreach uh, for those small businesses that are in need of grants as well too. And then also just providing the messaging um, of that we are in a hot spot and uh, things that they can do at their business to remain proactive and, and helping us slow the spread as well too. Okay, either my chat is not working uh, or Dr. Sun and Shine, you did an amazing job covering all sorts of issues and questions that everyone is so very happy. We did get um, from our fire chief, uh, fire chief good is that it was a great presentation and uh, lots of uh, information and wanted to thank you for your dedication as well to Dr. Sun and Shine and Janine Fowler. Um, I know that this is just the start and you know, it, it's not um, positive news that we're in a hot spot, but I think it is, um, as Superintendent Gutierrez mentioned, uh, it's data and that data is powerful. Um, and so now we know uh, what our marching orders are on how to slow the spread here in our community, uh, to take this very seriously and aggressive and to step up our, our proactive actions that we have been doing. Um, and collaboratively, it, it truly is gonna take um, each and every one of us in our community, um, you know, to educate maybe our neighbor and, to, and knowing that we can make a difference and each and every one of us will make that difference to slow the spread here in our community. Um, and not seeing any other questions. So if I don't have any other questions from our staff or from our council or from our superintendents um, or from our chat, I know that each and every one of us have a busy uh, evening. And I would just, again, wanna thank you, Dr. Sun and Shine for taking this time uh, to really truly uh, having this public health update for our community. We're gonna rebroadcast this uh, social media wise as well too. So those that weren't with us today can also hear uh, the update as well too and listen to, listen to it as well. Uh, but again, uh, we look forward to working with you um, so that we can definitely slow the spread here uh, in the city of Tolleson. Uh, with that. Yay. Thank you very much, Mayor and members of the council. Thank you so much. We're happy to partner with you and we appreciate all the work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. With that, um, do I have a motion for an adjournment? Council Member Labudin had made the motion and is seconded by Council Member Edivis. All those in favor of adjournment, please signify by a thumbs up or by saying aye. We got thumbs up here. <laughs> Anyone opposed to an adjournment, please signify by thumbs down or saying nay. We have unanimous approval on an adjournment. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. And we look forward to each and every one of your help uh, in the future. Thank you so much.